like to say welcome and thank you all so very much for taking the time to join us today for the opening webinar of the International Association for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network Mentorship Program on Research in Global Adolescent Health. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Molly O'Sullivan and I am one, and I am one of the committee members of the YPM Communications Committee. I also work with Professor Patton at the Centre for Adolescent Health in Melbourne, Australia. So thank you again for joining us this evening for the opening webinar of our mentorship program on researching global adolescent health. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are located today and any First Nations people attending this webinar. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. The YPN is thrilled to be launching its Flash Mentorship Program. The program, which focuses on the dissemination of adolescent health research, consists of three virtual webinars that are open to the public, as well as four small group mentorship sessions. Some quick housekeeping. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available on the IAAH YouTube channel. Um, please, if you um, use the Q&A function to ask any questions of Professor Patton and use the chat functions just to make some introductions and for any comments or anything that you may have during the webinar. I would also like to um, acknowledge Sue. So Suzanne Crowley, who you may recall hosted the previous webinar that we ran, she's moderating the chat function in the background. Um, we're very, very excited to have Professor George Patton as our speaker tonight. George has a clinical background in child and adolescent psychiatry and a research background in developmental epidemiology. In 2016, George chaired the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing and has led two special series in adolescent health for the Lancet Journal, as well as published sentinel papers on adolescent mortality, burden of disease, intergenerational risks, and adolescent investment cases. George has had consultancy and advisory roles with WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, USAID, and the World Bank, as well as scientific advisory roles with international groups, including Peking University, Tokyo University, and the University of Washington's Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. In 2019 and 2020, George was named a highly cited researcher by Clarivate's Web of Science. Basically, this award identifies the world's most influential researchers, so the select few who have most frequently been cited by their peers over the last decade. George, welcome and over to you. Many thanks, Molly. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you from. Um, I'm bringing up my slides here just as I speak to you. So I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, now, hopefully that's um, going to be visible to you and I'll check with Molly um, that yes, it's it in the Perfect. right mode. Brilliant. Okay. So I am had mixed feelings about talking to you about, about this today. On the one hand, I'm delighted to talk to you about getting published in a noisy world. On the other hand, I am aware of, it makes me feel very old because so much has changed since I began writing scientific papers uh some close to 40 years ago and um how we work in today's world so what i'm going to try and do today is um give you an idea of how things have changed and what we've learned about getting published today um so much has changed but one thing hasn't changed and that's uh, that bean counters are still active wherever you are whether you're applying for a grant for the new job the promotion it often depends on whether you can provide the beans that uh, those bean counters need uh, so that motto that dates back to the 1930s publish or perish rules um, as much today in academia as it did when I started out 40 years ago. Um, 
So I could have given this title, number of uh, this presentation, a number of titles. I've given it bold, not boring, getting published in a noisy world, but I could have used the title simply publish or perish still. Or it could have been how to write your killer paper. Uh, that's an Australian expression, an Australian notion, but hopefully the meaning is clear, sort of a paper which stands out and makes you stand out from, uh, from the crowd. But I want to start, if I can, by going back to when I began. And this is, I just want to remind you what data analysis looked like when I started out back in the 1980s. There were no personal computers. Everything that I did was on a mainframe. If you wanted to run a chi-squared test or a t-test, and that was about all you could do back then, you did it uh, using punch cards, which you then fed into the computer program. And if you got one of those little punch holes, those hanging tags wrong, you'd have to come back the next day and correct it. And maybe the next day, and maybe the next day as well. Programs like SAS and SPSS existed, but they were nothing like the form that we have today. Um, um, if you submitted a paper, um, you probably only had one paper that you were working on at a time. If you're really ambitious, you might have had two, um, but you'd submit multiple photocop multiple copies of the manuscript in large envelope, in large envelope, and then you'd wait. You'd wait six months, maybe even twelve months, to get a first round of reviews, um, unless you worked in one of the big institutions like. Harvard or UCL or King's or somewhere like that in a big center where you were perhaps closer to the editor. So roll on a few decades and everything looks completely different. You are now working in a world that's so full of information and competing voices. It's a world where evidence and research is being challenged as it never has been before. And it's a world where getting heard and getting published is getting harder and harder. So I want to look at what's changed in a little bit more detail. And I want to go back to that pre-digital age. Sounds prehistoric, doesn't it? But when I started out in the 1980s, we were working in a world where we were research poor, information poor, data poor. Uh, we were generally working with a very tight focus in a little niche that we were publishing in, um, and in general, much smaller fields than we have today. We had a big distance from editors because editors, they lived in different countries and different cities, and there weren't so many of them because there weren't so many journals. So we were tightly focused, we worked within disciplines, and we spoke to our specialized audiences within those disciplines. Okay, but moving on to today, it's looking very different. Now we are drowning in information and data. Um, information and data is power in a way that it wasn't back in the 1980s. Um, we're living in a world where journals have changed, where we're talking about open access publishing. We're talking about dealing with a different kind of problem. We're living in a world where there's complexity. Uh, we have, as I'll come on to say, a much more porous relationship uh, with editors and journals. It's a noisy world where it's not just about the evidence and the science, it's also about the politics um, in which we're working. So it's hugely different. In this talk, I want to talk, I want to sort of address three things really. How you might, how you pull a good paper together, and I'm going to talk about the traditional and conventional ways and some of the more modern ways of pulling a paper together. How to make an effective pitch, uh, and that's a pitch to an editor and his or her readership how to manage peer review. But I also want to add in a little bit more. One is uh, sort of even before you start pulling a paper together. And I also want to say something at the end about what comes after. Uh, you've actually got your paper accepted for publication. So 
the first thing, which is very much on my mind um, at the moment, is you've got to start by asking a decent question. And this is captured beautifully by Dilbert. Uh, so that's my question, says the applicant. Um, Dilbert says, uh, I try not to judge people by the quality of the technical questions they ask. Applicant asks, is it working? Not even a little. <laughs> And this was brought home to me recently because the current editor of the Journal of Adolescent Health, Carol Ford, initiated a process to review how the journal is dealing with international submissions. So those from outside the United States. And asked a number of us to take a look at consecutive, a consecutive series of submissions from these countries to the journal. It was totally revealing for me in that I could tell almost from a title almost sort of from the title, almost always, whether it would be sent out for review. The question had to be pitched that it was interesting enough, big enough, not too big, not too small, in that Goldilocks zone for a question, in order for it to attract editorial attention. And that's really what I'm gonna be talking about today in terms of how do you do that. So, um, principles of writing a good paper. Um, so these are some of the principles that I've learned that are important. And it starts with trying as far as possible to write something which is novel. First papers get cited, um, or if it's framed as the first paper in a field, it attracts attention. Um, and in a world that's moving very quickly, it's very noisy, the gap between <laughs> what's new and old hat is actually becoming a lot smaller than it was. So here's a paper that appeared back in 2020, and it's from Russell Viner, who's uh, based at uh, University College London. It was published in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. Um, that was early in 2020, just as the pandemic was getting underway. And people were thinking, well, what do we do about schools? So Russell, to his credit, together with his colleagues at UCL, uh, pulled together a rapid review of the evidence to that point around school closures and management practices during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, that paper was the first, and uh, it's only a bit over a year on, it's been cited over a thousand times and illustrates the principle of getting in first if you can, um, being the first paper in the field. Now, the challenge is that you can't always be the first paper in the field. <laughs> but one trick that you can use is to frame something as the first paper on a topic. And I'm illustrating that here with a paper that we published some years back. Um, it's called, the title gives it away in a sense, Reverse Gateways, Frequent Cannabis Use as a Predictor of Tobacco Initiation and Nicotine Dependence. So this was a field where there had been much published about the way in which uh, drug use, substance use was initiated across development. And there was the gateway theory that had been promulgated by Denise Kandel, who was a North American developmental epidemiologist. I think it was back in the 1970s when this idea was um, first around. And we were coming to this 30, 40 years after she'd already published about the gateway theory. The idea had been that there was a fixed and regular sequence in drug use, beginning with tobacco, moving from tobacco to alcohol, and from there to cannabis, and from cannabis to other illicits. But this paper flipped that on its head, and it said, well, we've had a huge emphasis on tobacco control. Tobacco control in many high-income country settings is now less common than cannabis, or can tobacco use is less common than cannabis use in many high-income countries. I wonder if cannabis use might now precede tobacco use and actually be the pathway, the gateway, to tobacco initiation and nicotine dependence. And that was what this paper was about. So framing something as the first paper through a twist in an idea is another way of being the first paper in a field. Another principle that I think is really important is 
have a look around your field that you're working in and ask a question as to what the thought leaders in the field are doing. And here are some thought leaders over recent decades in development, developmental epidemiology focused on adolescence to a large extent. Um, David Ferguson on the left from Christchurch. Uh, who is a sort of out, an outstanding figure in the field. He died a couple of years ago, um, but really was an incredible sort of overachiever. And uh, Timmy Moffat and Absalom Caspi on the right, who are now based at Duke um, in the United States, had previously been at King's College in London. So what you need to do is you need to look at what they do. <laughs> um, but if possible, try to do something different to what they're doing because they do it so well that you probably won't be able to compete with them unless you're working in their group. I wanted to turn to looking at the nuts and bolts of writing a paper. And I want to show you how I was taught to do it um, uh, when I was first supervised and mentored. Um, and it went something like this in terms of timeline. You'd have a basic question. And it was generally a question that was not particularly well formulated, but you would put together some tables, roughly addressing the questions. You might do some iterations around the tables. You would fi fi sort of hit on a final set of tables. You would then write up the results, the methods, the discussion. And then you'd move to the introduction because you'd then begin to tell the story of what you had done. Um, the last thing you would do would be the abstract uh, before tweaking the analysis and the tables. And then you'd write the title, probably the absolute last thing before finding um, a journal to submit to. And that was very much a tr traditional way of writing papers. Um, it followed some of the principles of being well established about how to write. So I was taught these kinds of rules for effective writing. Um, George Orwell's rules um, still hold today um, and are still a cornerstone of good writing, but these were promulgated within the field in which I worked. So never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech, which you are used to seeing in print. So this is written back in 1944. Never use a long word when a short word will do. So that was always use the Anglo-Saxon word if you're writing in English. If it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Never use the passive where you can use the active. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word or jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent and break any of these rules sooner than saying anything outright barbarous. So these are great rules and I'd still recommend them to you. So that was how I was taught um, to write a paper. Um, but um, things have changed and that traditional approach really doesn't work for many of the papers that we need to write. Um, and it's writing for a specialized audience and increasingly the audiences that we're writing for today are diverse. Um, I do have one extra slide on this, which, I'm, which I've left in here, which was just to give you an idea of how a master would approach writing a paper. And so this is David Ferguson, and this is how good you can get. And I've ne never met anybody as good as David at writing a traditional paper. Um, so on Monday, David would start his writing week and he would uh, turn to his mate, John Hallward, who he was working, who worked with his biostatistician and um, ask, what will we do this week? Let's take a question and do a quick and dirty analysis on Monday. Um, Tuesday, they'd come into the office and look at it again and ask the question, is there anything worth pursuing in that analysis we did yesterday? Yes or no? If no, the answer is go to the pub and take the week off for fishing. Um, if the answer was yes, they do a proper analysis on Wednesday and they do a literature search, not a highfalutin systematic review necessarily, a Google search would do. Thursday, they pull the draft of the paper together. On Friday, they proof, write the covering letter and submit the paper and then go to the pub. And that was David's perfect writing week. 
this man was prolific um, in his ability to uh, produce. He was a master of the art of the traditional paper and somebody who I ended up learning quite a bit from. But as I've said, the traditional paper doesn't work always. Um, and it won't work for all audiences. So an alternative way of writing a paper that I'd like to suggest you consider is comes from the area of business, business management. Um, it derives from this lady who worked at the Harvard, Harvard Business School, Barbara Minto, and it's the pyramid principle. And it works for so many papers, the traditional, but also non-traditional. Uh, papers where you aren't actually dealing with a, such a narrow, tight focus. It's one that's uh, been picked up widely by generation of business leaders and really underpins how to write a business case. Um, and it's a terrific way of thinking about what your question is and what the narrative might be around any given question. Now, I don't have time today to go into the pyramid principle because that's a seminar in itself, um, but you'll find lots written about it online. They may not be in the health and medical area. They may be in areas such as uh, KPMG or Boston Consulting, um, but essentially there are three steps to this process, which I will try to explain. So the steps are describing the situation, describing a complication or a tension, if you like, in this situation, and then outlining the answers that are needed. So in this first step of describing the situation that a field faces, this is about engagement with your readers. This method takes into account the cognitive limitations that we all have and that any reader has. So it's a step that's essential in attracting a reader's attention and often begins with something that's familiar to a reader, easy to process in terms of presenting a situation and then a problem. And the problem might be one of policy implementation, practice, equity, um, a problem that a reader sees as important enough to keep on reading. Um, there can be some elaboration, but it moves into fairly quickly into a presentation of the complication, which is really what are the obstacles for preventing us sorting out this problem in policy implementation or practice or sort of improving sort of outcomes of the particular health problem, for example. Um, it's a point where you as an author attempt to engage your reader emotionally. So raising anxiety, frustration, surprise, curiosity are the kinds of things that you're trying to engender in your reader. And then the third step is really that one of providing the answers. And how does this paper that you are writing remove those barriers, remove those obstacles? And that's what the paper is about. That's the pyramid principle. And it looks like something like this. Um, sorry, this is in, um, from the uh, Lancet uh, Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. That was a big publication, a 50,000 word document that began with a very simple structure, which looked something like this. We have the largest population of young people ever on planet Earth. Um, investing in their health brings a triple dividend of health and development during adolescence, better health across the life course, a better start to life for the next generation. The complication that we face is that adolescent health has not improved. There's been a failure to invest. It's led to a lack of knowledge, a lack of people working in the field, a lack of systems. And what we risk here is a lost generation rather than a demographic dividend. So the question for the commission was, well, what are the investments we now need to make? And the answer to that is three things. We need to think differently, we need to act differently, and we need to hold governments to account. And from there, the pyramid of the paper essentially was formed. So that pyramid goes on, and if you take, uh, for example, box E, we might say that the problem is, well, we don't have accountability frameworks to hold uh, governments to account. Um, 
Why don't we have that? Well, one reason might be we have an absence of good data. Um, how do we present solutions to getting better data? Well, we need to, for example, harmonize our data systems better. We need greater digital data collection. We need to collect different kinds of data. And so you can see this method continues to go down in a pyramid. I found it an incredibly useful way of approaching the writing of a paper. So you've written your brilliant paper um, and you're very proud of it as I'm sure you will be, I always am. Um, you now need to make the pitch and that's a pitch to a journal editor. And here are two well-known journal editors in the adolescent health field. Charlie Irwin on the left, the most recent editor of the Journal of Adolescent Health and Carol Ford on the right. And I wanna say it really makes a big difference to know your editor. Um, ideally, personally, um, I understand their values, understand what they prioritize and what they're interested in. You know, I used to tell people that for Charlie, um, it was actually hard to get Charlie interested in cross-sectional surveys um, because there were many of them and there were limits to, he understood there were limits to what you could actually say from a cross-sectional survey most of the time. Um, so I generally suggest don't send it to the Journal of Adolescent Health. A systematic review or a clinical trial was completely different. These were the kinds of things that Charlie valued um, hugely in terms of the readership of the journal. So understanding your editor is really important. And with that, you need to understand your journal. Um, so the Journal of Adolescent Health is a really important journal for our field. Um, um, so got to understand that the readership tends to be a clinical readership, the members of the Society of Adolescent Medicine, because it is the journal of the Society of Adolescent Medicine. So cross-sectional population-based surveys aren't always that interesting to that readership. Uh, they're more interested in things that are relevant to clinical practice. So RCTs, as I said, get a better clinical run. Um, we've published a fair bit with The Lancet and The Lancet suite of journals. Um, it's all of the above, um, plus some extras. You need a clear, big idea. Um, it's got to be relevant to policy, ideally politically relevant. So something which is you know, a bit more uh, going to sort of attend, attract the attention of political leaders and um, decision makers. Something large scale is good. A number of a million or more in a study will pretty much guarantee, you know, if the other things are right, it'll get into the Lancer. It can be quirky and different, a new idea, but really new and one that sort of will make people sit up and think. So in making your pitch, the title of your paper is going to be really important. And this is where you need to be bold, not boring. Uh, catch, you need to catch the attention of a readership, uh, of, of, of an editor. Um, and an editor will be thinking, well, will, will this capture the attention of my readership? Will it capture the imagination of the, pop, of the general public? Good titles get a lot more citations. So here's a title uh, from one of the first papers I ever published in The Lancet, which was on global patterns of mortality in young people, a system, systematic analysis of population health data. And it's striking in the sense that it was the first paper on patterns of mortality at a global level. Um, but it also implied with that systematic analysis of population health data that this was sound scientifically, which I believe it was, um, <laughs> given the data we had available at, at the time. Here are some other titles. No, sorry, sorry, that's my next slide. Um, so a good title is going to be very much like good writing. And these, a bit like Orwell's principles, um, a brief main phase is good. Anglo-Saxon, short words are better in English. It needs to resonate with the audience. Ideally, it's attention grabbing, grabbing, but signals also what the content is going to be. So here in my next slide are some titles. Um, one I've already talked about, Reverse Gateways. Uh, Susan Sawyer published a paper on the age of adolescence, which I think is second only to Russell Viner's in terms of citations in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. It's just a title which makes you want to look at and you go, oh, I wonder what that's about. 
um, the title of the commission was Our Future, an answered commission on adolescent health and well-being, adolescence and the next generation. Um, the title of a new series that's going to appear on adolescent growth and nutrition in the Lancet. Um, the comment begins with nourishing our future, which again picks up on the 2016 uh, Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing title. So titles are really, really important. Um, the covering letter is often neglected, um, but is just so important. It might be the only thing that a journal editor reads. They may not even read your abstract, but they will read your covering letter. So this is something which is worth spending a lot of time on. Um, my approach to a covering letter, I use the pyramid principle to lay out the argument. I link where I can to journal priorities or published papers they've published emphases uh, that they've had in the past so that an editor doesn't have to do the thinking you've done the thinking for them in terms of how does this link to my journal's agenda i think about what the relevance to the mainstream media is because journals um, journals also have audiences beyond a specialist readership. Um, they're interested in getting picked up by mainstream media, by television, by dailies, um, by, other, by other journals and magazines. And you should keep it short. Again, keep in mind that editors are busy people. They have a limited attention span and, sorry, my camera is just going off. <laughs> Actually, you can still see me. Um, so go for under a page in a submission letter. So here's an example of a submission letter from some years ago. And now it's longer than I would write today. I would cut this by probably a third today, but it was on a manuscript around do optimistic adolescents fare better in terms of their health and development. Um, so you can see, um, so this was published in Pediatrics, um, which is not a bad um, journal. Um, it was a topic which is a little off topic for Pediatrics, which is clinically oriented. So needed some engagement with the editor. So the strategy here was that element of connecting with what an editor will have read in the popular press and heard about optimism and positive psychology on TV, magazines, newspapers, um, the controversy around whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Hopefully, I, well, I think I did engage the editor and then presented the problem of the limited, limited, limited evidence that we had around this. Too many cross-sectional surveys. We really can't unpack cause and effect, directionality. So we need high quality longitudinal studies. This paper is based on such, just such a high quality longitudinal studies, does X, Y, and Z. And in the end, we find that optimism does indeed have benefits in terms of adolescent health and development. Simple in terms of the narrative, um, worked in terms of went out for submission and was accepted. You can go off piste in your engagement with, with an editor. Um, so uh, this is an example of going off piste with, I think I've got Richard Horton here on the left. So the editor of The Lancet. Um, so we had a paper that we did want to pitch to The Lancet. Um, it was on an intergenerational study, but it was not quite necessarily the kind of thing The Lancet um, would publish. And if we submit it to The Lancet directly, possibly meet with a rejection just because they're getting too much stuff. Um, but we, Susan Sawyer and I found out that Richard was in Melbourne and so we took the opportunity to take Richard out to dinner. Now we really like Richard and it was a great dinner, but there was an opportunity during the course of having dinner with Richard just to drop this work that we were doing. So it happened that Richard had a particular interest in this topic, having done some clinical work in the area. And bingo, we were there. He was primed to actually receive um, the submission letter and the paper. And it was, in fact, published in The Lancet. Um, uh, here's another example of going off piste. Uh, this is Ihan Chu, who's an editor with Nature. Um, we, I had heard that Nature were putting together a compendium on adolescent health. 
um, that was being coordinated out of California. I happened to be in San Francisco, um, wrote to her, we had coffee, put a proposal to her about a paper on intergenerational adolescence and the next generation. And that was an example of going off piste. Cost of a coffee, it's not actually sort of a bad outcome. It was a good paper too, I think. Um, peer review is the next thing that you actually have to deal with. Um, that again is a seminar in its own right. And I'm only going to touch very lightly today because I need to finish given time. Um, it's, as I said, it's a seminar in its own right, but peer review has changed enormously. In the old days, the burden was not so great of peer review, and you could be fairly certain you'd get someone who was an expert in your narrow field, the one that you were publishing in. Sadly, it's no longer true, and there's enormous variation now in the quality of peer review, um, and it's a frustration um, that we all have to deal with. Don't take it personally. Um, you can be lucky as well. Um, um, but it's the kind of thing where you need to take it with a pinch of salt if you get bad reviews. It's all part of what has become, begun this more complicated game of getting published. For some journals, peer reviews uh, can be really extensive. Uh, for one paper in The Lancet, I think I ended up with 11 peer reviews on a, given, on a single paper. That's unusual, um, but really it is the kind of thing where you need to get organized, you need to follow the guidelines, you need to make a list of points, mark up the paper, keep track changes. Um, really, you know, it's about getting obsessional if you're not obsessional um, or drawing on your obsessionality if you are already uh, somebody who gives attention to detail. Um, the, almost the last thing I want to say is that in a noisy world, it doesn't stop with the publication. Um, in the old days, um, you could um, send out a press release and think that you were being proactive <laughs> um, if a journalist um, called you to talk to you about the paper. Nowadays, it's about writing pieces for consumption by the general public. Um, here's one that I did recently um, for the conversation. Um, it's about social media, something which my generation is far less experienced in than your generation. So I rely on people like Molly O'Sullivan to help me with that. Um, releasing videos, here's one that Susan um, did for the Lancet Commission and back in 2016. And that's the kind of thing which is presenting information in a form that the public, the media, can consume rapidly um, if you want to capture primetime American TV. Producing a video is actually has, you know, in the last decade been not a bad way of doing it. Um, it's prepackaged, they may pick it up, and you might get 10 seconds on primetime. So I want to leave you with um, the words of a taxi driver. Uh, Mr. Singh, who drove Susan and I on a trip across the northwest of India over the course of about 10 days, uh, it was probably almost a decade ago. We were both astonished, we were, both of us were astonished and challenged by the traffic in India. This is a very typical scene in a place like New Delhi, even at the days before, well, certainly in the days before COVID-19. Um, and if you've been there, you will know what a busy, noisy, competitive place it is. It's a bit like our academic world. And there are some parallels. So we asked Mr. Singh, as we said, um, how do you manage to drive in a place like this? And he sort of issued words of wisdom. He said, you need three things to drive in India. And they have parallels in publishing in our noisy world. You need good brakes. That means you really, we need sound technology. So we need good technical underpinnings for any paper that we write. It's up to date and maintained. You need a good horn was the second thing that you need to drive in India. And as you will remember, those of you who know India, what a noisy place, what a noisy place the streets are. You need to be able to signal your presence effectively with editors and audiences beyond. So that's the communication bit. And the final thing you need to drive in India, which you also need in academia, was good luck.
on the, as in the roads of India, you can only control the things that you can control. And that's also true in publishing what eventually will be for you that high impact killer paper. Thank you, and I'll throw it open for discussion at this point. Thanks, Molly. You're on mute, Molly. Brilliant. Thank you, George. That was fantastic. We do have some questions that have popped up. So the first one has come from Stephanie. Just simply, how do you get to know an editor? Do you have any advice for early career researchers, particularly in the COVID world, when meeting an editor isn't always at always possible. You don't have the conferences, but you get that chance to meet them. Um, so less opportunity. So any tips? So this is um, a slide that I could have put into this um, presentation. Um, and there are a number of ways of doing it. So one thing that is really helpful is to have a, have a mentor or mentors um, in your academic life. So those might be people in your institution uh, who are senior figures um, who know the journal editors um, or who can, even if they don't know a journal editor, can reach out and speak to you, speak to a journal editor on your behalf. Um, in the days prior to COVID-19, we would meet at conferences and conferences were a fabulous place to meet editors. So um, editors go to um, uh, conferences because they're looking for talent, they're looking for material, they're looking for new ideas and they want to get them in their journal. So the Society of Adolescent Health and um, Medicine meeting was a good meeting uh, for that because the North American editors would go there. The International Association of Adolescent Health meeting is a great meeting because some of the more globally oriented editors go to those meetings. So again, um, there having a senior colleague introduce you to an editor is often a good way and that senior colleague can then uh, spruik on your behalf, you know, the work that you're doing um, and get you known. But it's a bit more than that. And I, I really do think this role of finding a mentor who can support you. So one thing that um, you know, I, for example, do with some of the people who I supervise and mentor would be to, so I, I get to review lots of papers. Sometimes with a paper, um, I will um, give it to a junior colleague and ask her or him to review the paper. And I will send that back, acknowledging in my letter to the editor, back to the editor that I was assisted by. Um, Sometimes with that, there'll be an invite that comes back to write a comment on that paper. And this happens quite a bit. That's a further opportunity for you to work with a mentor um, if your mentor is generous. So finding a generous mentor is something which um, is really, really helpful. Um, it's helpful to your mentor because you can keep them abreast of all those new things that they don't know about. Those new, new analyses, the new social media. Um, but that would be the way in which I think I would, I would approach it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, George. So kind of going back to that mentor, what features do you think, I know it's slightly off topic, but just a quick question, what features do you think we should, um, early career researchers should be looking for in a mentor? Generosity, I think, is the most important. Um, um, I think match with your areas of interest is important. Um, somebody who has some creativity and thought, who can see a bigger vision, a vision beyond their own work. Um, I think technical skills are good if you can find them in a mentor. Um, so those would be some of the things I would be looking for. And if you're looking for more than one mentor and i think you know sort of any mentor is only going to offer you so much um some diversity i think in perspective um but somebody who is connected um is really what you want in a mentor um somebody who's connected scientifically um you know to different groups in different places that are relevant to you um who can make introductions that's the, i think the kind of person you want Brilliant. Thank you, George. Um, another question. Well, I've got lots of questions, but kind of just skimming through. Um, just This is a question that's come from Scarlett. Um, I'd love to hear your advice on how much attention journals pay in general to track records. 
and especially obviously towards students, early career researchers, um, you know, how much may that hinder? And I suppose how then important is it to make sure you've got a professor on your authorship list? Um, look, I think it varies. Um, and I don't think journals necessarily have a policy on this. Um, and it will vary from editor to editor. It may depend on task, on the task that you are, the particular paper that you're writing. In general, I find that um, good journals are looking for young talent coming along. They're looking for the new leaders and they're wanting to foster the new leaders. Um, one thing that I could mention and I could actually recommend you do um, if you have an opportunity is to um, see if you can spend some time um, sitting in at a journal. It can be in the form of an internship, which can be brief. Um, it can be the kind of thing where you sit in on an editorial meeting to actually see how decisions are made at a journal. That can also be a really good way of introducing yourself to sort of editors in that setting. Um, but so I, I think it all depends is, is the truth of the answer. Um, if it's a straight research paper and you've done a good job, um, I think journal editors will um, except at whatever stage you're at, I think that senior authors can sometimes add some gravitas. Um, but again, it, I think you've got to know your editor to know whether or not that's going to be necessary. Okay. Thank you, George. Um, a question that's come through from Carly. Um, what do you think are some of the greatest challenges to publication for students and early career researchers? Um, I, as I think I've communicated, Carly, it, it's become a lot more complicated um, and competitive than it was. Um, COVID-19 has made it a lot worse. Um, so journals have been inundated. So we've all been working online. We've had a mass of papers around COVID-19. Um, and so journals are currently inundated with papers, making it um, more difficult to get papers up in almost any top tier journal. Um, so um, I, I, th I think you know, the big challenge is going to be around presenting something which is a big enough study, a big enough question, an innovative enough approach. Uh, that's what you've got to be doing with journals today in order to get into the higher tier journals. Um, we've got a proliferation of journals as well, which is challenging for the field. Many of them are journals that will probably never be read much. Um, um, obviously some are predatory or on the margins of being predatory. Um, so I think that can also be a challenge for the young researcher as to um, how do I judge where to send this? Um, how do I get the best possible quality of journal, the best readership for my paper? So I think those are some of the challenges that you face in a way that I never faced 40, 30, 40 years ago because really, you know, there were four journals in the area that I was publishing, only four. Um, so it was simple. Yeah. Thank you, George. It kind of leads on well to um, another question. So this is um, from an anonymous question. Just again, thank you for a brilliant presentation. And I wonder if you have any suggestions as to how the scientific community can push back against prevailing quantity over quality judgment from NHMRC, promotions committees, um, and I suppose journals as well, in a sense, to some small degree. And what can early career researchers do to change these norms? Yeah, it's a real problem that um, the easiest metrics is a simple count of um, journal publications. Um, and um, if you're looking at um, other metrics such as impacts on policy and practice, they are more difficult to um, measure, more difficult to assess. Um, and so, there often is a knee-jerk reaction just to go back to um, the bibliometrics. Um, 
I, I think there is a more sophisticated approach emerging, um, which is looking at um, the quality of the publication and the extent to which it may have changed thinking, changed policy, changed practice. Um, so in the UK, um, that has certainly um, come to be prominent. Um, in Australia, it has come to be prominent. Um, I think it's still probably rolling out in other places. Um, we do quite, quite a lot of work with colleagues in China, and I get the impression there that what really counts is publication in these top tier journals, not so much numbers, um, but you know, it's a different metric. It's um, whether you are a lead author or a corresponding author in a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I think um, it's going to be different things in different places. Um, but agree that no country, no system has got the metrics right yet. Okay, thank you, George. And again, this is kind of going back to the pitching. Um, obviously, if you don't always get a significant revolt, um, result or your findings don't reveal anything significant, do you still encourage that pitching or any sort of tips to kind of make that get across the line? Oh, absolutely. And that's the sort of old trick of... Um, you frame your narrative differently. Um, so you frame it so that this becomes a novel finding. Um, so um, with that, um, it's telling a story how the literature would suggest that you should be having a positive finding. There are all of these studies which suggest that um, this is what you would expect from a study of this kind. However, you have um, a negative finding. This is really important um, in terms of publication. Um, so that's the, it's again a bit like the reverse gateways, you reverse your narrative um, to make it something which is interesting, new, different. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and this is again, lots of questions, I'm trying to skim through if you see my eyes darting off to the side. Um, what are your views on publishing in open access journals? Do you believe this can help in translation of research findings, as there seems to be more emphasis on translation with some, obviously with funding bodies these days. So are you kind of in favor then of the open access? Yeah, look, it, it's the future. Um, open access is undoubtedly the future. And some of the traditional journals, um, uh, such as Nature, The Lancet, they're all struggling with how do they deal with this? Um, and they have um, different models. Many funders are increasingly uh, demanding that um, things appear open access, um, NIH, Gates, European Union, MRC, our own NH and MRC is looking at this at the moment. So it's going to be mandated. So it is going to be the future. Um, you know, there are some challenges in it. So open access papers get read because they're easily available. You just find them online. Um, you don't even have to register sort of to actually get them. So in terms of uptake and translation, they're terrific. Um, I'm not sure that the journals have necessarily worked out a, a funding model, and I think the, the industry is um, challenged by this. And we also have a problem that, um, you know, this problem of peer review quality. So many of us are just getting overloaded with um, requests for peer review. I can only deal with a fraction of the requests that I actually get, and I feel really badly about that, but I could spend all my working week just simply doing peer reviews um, now. So I'm not quite sure how we deal with that problem with, um, with open access because, um, uh, yeah, it's a problem with the mainstream traditional journals, but I think it's going to be an increasing problem as we move to ac open access models as well. Um, so that's not an answer to the question other than it's complicated, but it is definitely the way in which we are going to be publishing in the future. Okay, thank you, George. This is probably the last question because we're getting towards time. This is around sort of going back to co-authors and writing. Um, you know, how many is too many for co-authors? Um, how much time should we give um, co-authors in terms of responding to the paper and commentary? Um, and how best to approach senior authors like yourself? And again, I acknowledge I'm probably giving you 30 seconds to respond, um, but just kind of a quick question about, I suppose, numbers of authors. Well, the golden rule used to be that you'd have no more than six authors um, and that you'd have a, 
first author, you'd have a senior author, and then you'd have a second author and co-authors. Um, and that would reflect the relative contributions to the paper. Um, um, that rule seems to have gone by the wayside. And I think increasingly as we move to publications across institutions, um, the move beyond a single field, you know, six is just not enough. Uh, so if you look at genetics, you know, you can have uh, several hundred authors. You look at um, publications from the global burden of disease, often hundreds of authors. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, generally, I don't like to have, I would never have, I would never be on a paper if I haven't made a substantive contribution. I don't think I've ever been on a paper where I haven't made some contribution that I believe was a meaningful contribution to a paper. Um, and generally I expect that from co-authors, you don't always get it. Um, that can be frustrating. Um, sometimes I'll let that run for a single paper, but I might not go back to that co-author again in the future. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, a little bit of, sometimes there's checks and balances with this um, or roundabouts um, in the sense that you might have a co-author who contributes big time to one paper, but very little to another paper. That's okay. That's okay. As long as there's a contribution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, George. That was brilliant. I'm just going to quickly share my screen just for the last. Um, so again, obviously, Professor Patton, George, thank you on behalf of the International Association um, for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network. I would like to thank you for joining us today and for sharing your personal tips and tricks to help students and early career researchers get their research published. Thank you to everyone online who attended today. Um, your questions, there were so many um, to get through, but really thank you, it shows you were really super engaged. Um, just to let you know that this webinar, as I said at the beginning, will be available on the IAAH YouTube channel by the end of the week. And also just to say that um, a quick evaluation survey um, will be emailed to you tomorrow. It takes about one minute. It's really super quick, and this just helps us plan future webinars. And just to say, please join us for our next webinar. You'll see a little scan me on the screen that you can scan and it'll take you straight to our registration page. Um, so the next webinar, Stephanie, Jomia and myself will be sharing our tips on how you can give a fantastic enlivening presentation and also just some little um, stories and anecdotes about what you can do to promote yourself and your research. So thank you everyone again and good evening from Australia.